Um, Dave, first of all, thanks for another dynamic presentation. I always enjoy them. Um, I'm looking around the room and it seems to be heavy on planners. People who deal all the time in zoning Nerds. regulations. People who love acronyms, whatever you want to call them. Uh, but it's been my impression in going through the green building uh, group that none of the proposed changes here are ones to zoning regulations or planning principles. They are, they are all embodied in, and all, the, all of our hopes are essentially placed on building codes, energy codes, energy regulations. Would you say that's fair? Yeah, definitely it's fair. And, uh, you know, what I would say, too, is, and maybe I make my point kind of as I had hoped, when I was talking about this slide here, to date we've really regulated things through the building code. It's been our pri it's been our only mechanism for relating for regulating energy efficiency. And and it's broken. It hasn't worked. And you know the the problem for that is is that energy is operational and we still despite having a, a performance based code, we still have a show me code where the final compliance is is based upon a, an instructor uh, an inspector coming in here and checking that there's there's sprinklers mm -hmm. and you know lit up exit signs, right? And we can't actually see energy efficiency. So Energy utilization has always been an awkward fit for the code, and what I'm proposing here is that we maybe need to need new tools, and that maybe something that is more explicitly outside of the code, maybe it's something that's uh, applied through, I don't know if it's the zoning and development bylaw or, or something else, but you know, if people are throwing around terms like outcome-based policy or outcomes-based codes, I don't know if they necessarily fit within the building bylaw in the future. And if we were going to design a new system for energy efficiency compliance uh, going forward, I don't think we can be married to like our old, you know, our, our business as usual just because it's the easiest thing to do. I mean, if we're serious about our, our, uh, our goals, then we're going to have to start thinking seriously about changing our policy, I think. So I don't really have an I, I'd say yes, they're a critical part, part right now. It's where most of the infrastructure and staffing relies. But if you were to ask me 10 years from now, if we're still going to be regulating energy only in the building code, I would probably say no. Just maybe a comment to that. Uh, it, what, what strikes me is that uh, one of the things that we might be able to offer up are the incentives that David was talking about. And oftentimes that comes in through a development permit and what we can offer in terms of bonus FSR or whatever. So, so it does seem like it's a real big challenge in terms of how do we fit it into a new structure. Mm -hmm. So I guess the, the comment there for those who didn't hear you is that maybe that the incentives could be offered through the development permit process because the, the building code actually doesn't really offer any incentives or have any capacity to offer incentives. I, I would agree. And the only other thing that maybe you could look at from an incentive perspective is that's been successful in the jurisdictions is a fee bait model, you know, where, you know, people pay one set of fees that is higher if you're just coming in and meeting code or our base standard of building. But, you know, if you're 5% above code, maybe it's free. Or you know the old rate that you paid for for uh, a development permit. Maybe if it's ten percent, it's free. Maybe if it's fifteen percent, you actually get some money back. So I think we're gonna have to look at sort of revenue neutral ways like that. Maybe things like density bonusing, which you know don't come out of the pocketbook directly, but do have other trade off concerns. And I think that's one of the things we have to manage is how we fit green building into the other like the the other things we already bonus for and other priorities we have. Oh. Uh, if uh, if we were going to uh, uh, narrow this down to fundamental elements, what I'm hearing it's uh, energy, food, water, and waste. For the other broad green city goals, and, and then we have the green economy. But but those seem to be the fundamental elements. Uh, w what I'd like to notice is, uh, just speaking to what we've just been talking about, is when, when we were doing the plan for Northeast Falls Creek, it was, it was interesting the direction we initially got, which was, oh, well, the green stuff, you, we've got eco-density, you apply that at the rezoning stage. Uh, and yet, uh, what I'm observing right now as the rezoning inquiries come through is, well, you know, we have a, we've got a collection of high-profile architects in this town who do great buildings. Uh, and there's been a certain approach. We we can see the buildings we have downtown, and what I'm seeing is, you know, it looks kind of similar to what we've seen. Uh, and yet, uh, it was interesting when we went for our second round of public engagement. It was it was when we had a session with council. What they pointed out is no, you know, the whole green, you know, you have a vision for the neighborhood, but also how this is achieving our green objectives is right up there in front, even before all the policy directions you have. So in a sense, they're framing it. 
But I'd say that that uh, if we were to wind back the clock, if only we could do that to, before the strike when we started Northeast False Creek, uh, I think these questions really have you have to go to the development community and the architects and really engage them on it. Because the problem is. Uh, having been here 20 years ago when we were trying to get townhouses, just townhouses, uh, the problem was you have a very conservative development industry because they are funded by a very, very conservative financial institutions, and they want to see images of what ha- what product, so-called product, the the high rises downtown. Uh, because I'm primarily talking about high-rises here, have been sold. So in the case of when we actually achieved townhouses for the first time uh, in the Jim Chang development that's at Beach and Howe, uh, Hornby and Howe, uh, we actually had to go talk to the financial institutions to actually convince them that we were not going to, because they were saying we're not going to do townhouses at all. And, and we had to say, well, you know, you're not doing buildings downtown unless you do townhouses in these locations. So that's, that's my concern. Uh, I think I think there's there's quite a, a learning curve here, as well as uh, some early engagement of these folks. Because what I see in terms of rezoning inquiries coming in, uh, you might have some architects who have the knowledge base about dealing with energy, food, water, and waste. Uh, but that and that, and then the one, one other thing, it's also thermal gain during the summertime, because we know the. Just, I know I keep emphasizing this, but I'm glad it's talking about energy. Having lived in a high-rise now for a year, it's utterly unlivable, uh, you know, with it living in 85-degree, no ventilation except a fan on you in these buildings because literally the slabs, you've got these, these slabs with protruding uh, tongues, we call them, uh, you know, the balconies. But what they do is they suck in this energy and the whole building is just radiating energy at you all night. And all, I'll also add, all winter, I never once had the heat on in my apartment, and I had the windows open all winter. So that's how warm these buildings are. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, uh, you hit on a lot of points there, Michael, and I think that, you know, make no mistake about it, the development, the real estate and development industry, uh, no other industry worldwide spends less on research and development than the, uh, the real estate and development industry. Stationary manufacturers, people who make paper spend money on, more money on research and development than the real estate and development industry. Um, and to your point, I think, I think the green economy is, is, is another important one, not just kind of be tacked on, because I think what you're talking about with financial institutions Institutions, the, econ- the green economy is hopefully going to be the thing that adds energy to all of this, right? To, that drives, that really drives the innovation, dr- uh, makes people see the opportunity, and will make this palatable. I think for a lot of what we're talking about here, um, and, and hopefully be the way we achieve a lot of the buy-in. Um, you know, we were just actually talking about this. Uh, Yesterday, I think, or the day before, where we were saying, you know, we get all these requests from uh, from outside, from like, you know, University of Albuquerque or the, you know, the Melbourne Women's for Voting, you know, Association who want to come and tour the Olympic Village in our district energy system. And we haven't been proactive to date about saying, well, actually, who do we want to go out, recruit and take them through what a high performance building looks like, the net zero building? What, who do we want to actually take out? Do we want, we want to get James Chang and... You know Bruce Hayden and you know Graham McGarvin and all these other people who file these rezoning submissions for us. Do we want to actually get them out there and say, you know what, this is what the build is. You know, high performance buildings look different. They have less glazing. This is what they look like. This is how they they feel when they're inside. And uh, you know, this is you know by not building conventionally and having your energy system in the building, but maybe outside the building and sharing that collectively. How does that work? And how do you design for that? And what are the kind of tolerances? We're we're trying to design something for the fall where we we actually pick the people who we want to engage with and take them through on a walking tour and then help them understand this stuff better so that we can start setting ourselves up for success. And then finally, we are actually doing, in September, we're going to be doing a um, a process that will be related to the development of some of our financing tools. We've already had some of these discussions, but we are going to be addressing directly with the finance community mostly on energy efficiency financing, but that could pertain eventually also to, to new construction. So great observations and i would say that you know they're uh, they're great ideas and we've we've been doing some thinking about them too